all to uh, Traditional Arts Indiana's webinar here, Social Networking for Artists and Performers, Developing and Maintaining an Online Presence. We're excited to have with us Jeff Davis. I've been knowing Jeff for about six or seven years now. Uh, I think you were building ukuleles and playing ukuleles when I first met you. Now he's made uh, at least 50 little birds, uh, which is the name uh, name of his uh, his business and website and blogging community. And um, before I get into introducing Jeff, I should back up and say that this program is bought, brought to you by Traditional Arts Indiana, which is a partnership between the Indiana Arts Commission as well as Indiana University. And we exist to identify, document, and promote the folk and traditional arts. And one of the ways that we do that is by trying to provide training and resources for folk artists here in Indiana. But it's definitely open up to folks uh, a much farther afield uh, than that. I see we've got uh, Jeff Fulmer from uh, College of Southern Nevada. So always good to have folks from, uh, from farther away also part of this. The video will also be housed on our website so you can stream this later or share it with other people. So enough of that, uh, that information. Let's get into our introduction of Jeff. Jeff Davis is really a, a wonderful uh, artist, a musician, a performer, a uh, artisan at making everything from great big boats to little bitty birds, you might say. He once told me that uh, having a passion for if he has a passion for anything, he feels like he has to make it. Uh, and I've remembered that uh, over the years. I think that it's uh, important to realize that one of the reasons I've asked Jeff to be here, uh, in part because his daughter Hannah is one of our work-study students and helped put together this, uh, this workshop. But more importantly, it's because Jeff has developed a great online presence that spans uh, Facebook, Twitter, blogging, uh, and he's really kind of built a whole tribe around him uh, that supports what it is that he does. I'm not going to take up any more time because I think Jeff has a lot of wonderful information to share with us, so I'm going to turn it over to Jeff Davis. Thank you, John. I want to welcome everybody that's here today. It's great to see the list of names and, and see the people pop up. I think some of you are folks that I know, and I really appreciate you being here today, and I'd like to hear some feedback. Uh, when we're finished. I want to let you know that um, I've already posted notes from this from this talk at um, www.50littlebirds.com with links so that you can um, kind of follow along or if, if you um, want to look at things later they're all going to be there. You'll hear me flipping pages. I've never um, never done a webinar before. I'm a little nervous today. I've got my notes in front of me and it's um, I'm a career teacher. I've been teaching school for almost 30 years but it's kind of odd not seeing my students. And I also am not used to reading streams and, and looking at two or three things at once. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I've been, when John approached me about this, and Hannah, I was a little skeptical about why, what makes me an expert about social networking. I, I do a lot of social networking, and I really wasn't sure that I was qualified to do this. But when I really thought it through, I realized that I've been networking with artists, socially networking with artists um, since I was in college when I was writing letters to wooden boat builders in um, in New England when I was in college in Ohio and I was um, put an ad in the back of Wooden Boat magazine for a job working with wooden boats and, and that's that's kind of how it started. When the internet popped up it was it was very natural just to jump into chat rooms and the, um, the old list serves and the forums that were going at that time and so my social networking has kind of um, evolved parallel with the, with, um, the technologies, technologies that are available. I'm no computer guru or computer whiz, so anything I do, you can do. It just takes a matter of time and, and attention and, and keeping your eye on it. Um, when I, I'm not an expert. I can only tell you today about the things that I do and how they work and if they don't work. There are a lot of people out there that claim to understand a lot more than I do, and they might very well. I can just assure you that what I talk about today are the things that I actually do every, every few days, maybe not every day. Um, first of all, website. When I began... Way back in the day, I was um, actually a chalkboard artist for Marsh Supermarket Markets. I was drawing chalk on um, chalkboards to advertise their goods. And um, I wanted to get to know other chalkboard artists. I didn't know that if any others existed. I went to the internet. It was probably my first real internet foray into art. And I set up a web a website. There were, I learned to code a little bit of HTML, got on a free website host, and set up a website. 
And that's not necessary today. Um, when I started Bluestone Folk School, a, a traditional arts program that I run five or six years ago, I also set up a traditional um, a website using, um, I was using software at that time to write the website. Now that's not necessary. I use WordPress.com. And WordPress.com is, is a blog host. But the, the technology is so flexible that I don't look at it as a blog as much as I do as a website. And there are a lot of things that make that so. One of the limitations of an old school um, website is it's very difficult to keep it fresh. It's very difficult to change things. Going in and recoding or uh, re-editing your, your pages becomes tedious, and you will not want to do it for very long. When you use um, WordPress or another blog-based platform, it is very, very simple to go, go in and write, drop some pictures in, and your website's new every single time you do that. And then the things that you want to have up all the time on my website, again, www.50littlebirds, I have my um, art show schedules, my teaching schedules, um, gallery appearances, um, all those kinds of things that I want permanently established. They're on tabs across the top of the page. My bio is up there too. So that when folks come to my website, they'll see the things they traditionally want to see. But they'll also have whatever projects I'm working on, my new pieces, um, whatever I want them to read about that day or they want want to read about. And then down the sidebar, I, there's also a sidebar. And with WordPress, you have the flexibility to do that. I have links to uh, my Etsy site. We'll talk more about that. I have links to my Facebook, and we'll talk about that. And I have links to my Twitter, and that's all down the side. So by going one place and um, using WordPress.com, people are led to all the different parts of my social network. Those are the kind of things we used to try to do on, on um, on the old school websites, and it was very difficult to code. Again, with WordPress, I can change any of that information um, with just a few taps of a button. In fact, a lot of it can be done on my phone. Um, so my first recommendation to you is to get on WordPress and set up an account. It's absolutely free. And then start playing with it. And you set up a blog. You'll, you'll find a name for it. Give the name some thought, because that's going to be with you for a while. There's no undoing the name on these blogs. And name it something clever, something people will remember, something that's easy, something that will make a good web address, because we're going to encourage you to do that. And get on there and just start posting something. Play with it. See what works and what doesn't. One of the fears that people have in the beginning is you are actually posting things on the Internet, and they're afraid people are going to see it, people are going to judge them, think you don't know what you're doing, or you've got a bad start. or and Don't worry about that. Nobody is looking at your blog in the beginning. Nobody knows it's there. And um, you, can, you can delete those drafts. So get in there, dive in, and try it. Get some pictures on there. Um, set up. Go into the, uh, all the different menus, all the different tutorials. Explore things. Try them. Change them. There are templates to make it look many, many different ways. There are, there are um, things called widgets to put on your sidebar to have all kinds of different resources. The best way to do it is look at it and play with it. Um, About traffic, you're not going to have traffic for a while, and you've got to you've got to work hard to build that traffic. Oh, it has been pointed out that I am not following my PowerPoint. There's a page. My daughter is laughing at me in public. There we go. <laughs> Virtually laughing at me. I hope you're all laughing along with me. Um, When you set up the blog, like I said, it's going to be a long time before you get followers. In fact, it's kind of discouraging. So it's a good time to email your children, your mom, your dad, your cousins, your uncles. Let them know you have a blog out there and get them to start visiting so that you have a sense of what's going on um, with traffic. And then to build traffic, you need to start using, well, you need to attach your blog, your WordPress blog, to a URL. Mine is, of course, 50littlebirds.com. And the directions are on the WordPress site to do that. And there is a, a slight fee to do that, but it's not expensive. And you will then have a URL that people will remember. So make that associated with your name, your work, whatever it is that you do. And then use that URL everywhere. It should be on your business card. It should be on your flyers. It should be on signs in your booth at art shows and craft shows. If you are a performer, it should be on your CDs. Uh, it's just, it should be everywhere that you send things out. Put on the signature line of your emails, etc. Then you will start to slowly build, build up um, a following. 
there are lots of tricks to continue that. Um, link it to Facebook and Facebook and Twitter, and we'll talk about that a little bit um, to get people to follow back. But the one thing that I missed when I was doing this, and I just discovered this about six months ago, I've been told to visit other blogs and to comment often. The reason you want to do that is because Google looks for websites that have a lot of hits and a lot of or a lot of links that go back to them. So by visiting other websites and leaving your comment, if you visit through the WordPress platform, it leaves links back to your website. So every time you visit a website or visit a blog, make a comment, your that is linked back to your blog. And when Google goes through and searches, it, it'll discover the, the number of those those links and it will raise you up in the search engines. Um, my product is Carved Birds, and um, my hits have consistently increased in general searches, not just for me, but for Carved Birds, Indiana Carved Birds, um, Folk Carved Birds. Those hits have increased dramatically since I've started um, commenting actively on other blogs. It's also a good idea to read other blogs just to know how other people are doing it. I, I mentioned that you need to link to Facebook and to Twitter. Let's talk about Facebook, and my daughter Hannah's put some wonderful screenshots here. Um, in the top right, you can see my personal Facebook page. I think it's really important that you set that up. If you're not on Facebook and you want to um, have people following you and knowing about your art, you should be. So set up your Facebook. Um, this is your social network, your personal social network. So this isn't going to be business heavy, but I want to make it indicative of what I do so that people are always aware that I'm an artist and that I'm into birds. So you can see on my header, I'm out, out in the field. I spend time in the field every day I can. I was out this morning. Um, you see me with binoculars in the field. Um, I was actually on the Eagle Watch. And I, um, so I, I mentioned that on my Facebook page. On the personal Facebook page, talk a little bit about what you do as an artist. Don't talk like a salesperson. Um, that turns people off. But talk about this morning when I went out birding, I probably put on my personal page that I was out at Goose Pond um, watching the wild fowl. Um, I, and then I again put that on my business page. We'll talk about that in a minute. But let the people on your personal Facebook page know what you're doing as an artist like you would want to tell a friend or a colleague. And then on your business Facebook page, you can get a little more hardcore. This is the one in the middle um, with the Baltimore Oriole at the top. You can get a little more hardcore about this. This has got a picture of my artwork, of course. And then the picture of me is with my artwork. It's my newest um, artist portrait. And the blogs on here are much more specific to what I'm doing as an artist and a performer. And right now it's almost all my, all my birds. So this morning I saw e bald eagles. I saw pelicans all in southern Indiana. And I blogged about that so people knew that I was in the field. And the people that follow what I do know that Probably within the next week or two, they'll see carvings begin to emerge or drawings begin to emerge from that experience. So that's what you use the business page for. The business page, you can be a little more pushier. You can you can link to things you have on sale for sale on Etsy. We'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, you can um, talk about shows that you're doing. You start to be a little more businesslike. Now these do come across people's regular timelines across the regular personal page. So even though you could be more business-like, you still don't want to be the pushy, pushy salesman here. This is part of their informal social network. Then on the lower left is, the, is um, another one of the gold mines that's on Facebook, and that is um, an event page. This event page is set up for Indiana Artists and Marketplace, which is a show I was involved with last weekend. It's my biggest show of the year. I didn't set this up. It was set up by the um, Indiana Artists and Marketplace. Um, I would, I'm able to set them up just like this. I could have set up this one, but somebody done it first. And then I can invite my friends. And between my personal Facebook friends, and I realize these aren't friends, these are acquaintances and people on my network. I think you, your network is a better term. I had about four or 500 people on my personal network. I have 270 so in my business network. Some of them the same people. But most of those people got an invitation to the Indiana Artists and Marketplace. And because of that, and because of that and the efforts I do on my blog, um, every single one of my Indiana-based collectors showed up at that show, except you, Gail, um, showed up at that show and, and made purchases. So um, I know that's an effective means to let people know what's going on out there. Forums um, are the way that I really generated an awful lot of, of um, 
attention to business early on in, the, in um, my social networking. I don't do it so much anymore because the networks like Facebook are, are so much easier to reach many, many people quickly. But forums are still important. Um, when I started teaching in the Indianapolis Public Schools about 12 years ago, I started a ukulele band, and we were grossly underfunded, and I went to a forum, um, www.fleamarket.com, a ukulele forum, and put out the word that we needed ukuleles and um, equipment and supplies for this group. And we had many, many, many people come forward and donate ukuleles, donate money, send us music, and it generated an awful lot of interest in what we did. And I used that forum to um, announce what we were doing, what was happening, and the kind of things that were going on. Uh, that group turned um, grew much more than I anticipated. That's a whole other story. But we ended up hosting um, a major ukulele event, an early ukulele event. It was um, We had the Midwest Uke Fest in Indianapolis. And the last one we had attracted over 500 people. And all of that network, networking was done on ukulele forums. And there are several of them now. But these forums exist for absolutely every discipline. I, my carving, there are carving forums. There are decoy carving forums. Uh, there are, I'm on a tenor banjo forum. No matter how obscure your interest is, there's a forum somewhere for people that are doing it or people are interested in learning more about it. So search for those forums, um, participate in them, get on, answer questions, ask questions. Forums are not a place to, to sell things. And I want to make that really clear. Read the instructions when you sign up carefully and make sure you understand what's allowed and what isn't. You can get in trouble trying to um, sell people or sometimes even putting lists to your websites in a forum. So make sure you understand. But let people know what you're interested in, what you're doing, what your projects are, and um, they will become interested in you. And I think really if we go back and really look at social networking, you don't do a lot of hard sales. You don't do a lot of direct sales. Awful lot of what you're doing is building a network of people that are interested in what you do. And we're letting them decide for themselves whether they want to buy your art or not or come to your concerts or not. We're just trying to make sure that they know you're doing interesting things and putting it in front of them every single time you get a chance. Uh, if you look at the, the page here, Hannah put up an Etsy forum. And we'll talk more about Etsy in a minute. But Etsy is a community of artists that are selling. It's a sales website. And they have forums there. And you can join. They have some general forums. Or you can join special groups. I belong to a folk art group. I belong to an owl group. I belong to a nature and wildlife group. I belong to the men of Etsy, Indiana Etsy. Um, and the, and the, within these forums, even though these are artists, by participating, um, commenting, asking questions, you'll generate interest in what you do, and you'll find that hits on your blog, hits on your Etsy site will go up. There'll be more people interested in participating. Also, in these forums, whenever they'll allow, and they don't always, but whenever they allow, put links to the things that you're talking about that you're doing. I am uh, in a woodcarver forum that doesn't allow advertising, and, I, and so I don't, I don't want to do that. I respect that. Uh, but I do want to drive traffic to my blog. So whenever I take reference photos, and they're very, reference photos are important to bird carvers, whenever I take reference photos, I make sure that I announce it on that blog, and those folks will come from that blog, or from, from that forum, excuse me, from that forum to my blog, and download those pictures. And that, that accounts for an awful lot of my traffic and interest in my work. It does generate uh, sales occasionally. So make sure you, you find ways to link that forum back to your blog. Also, like I said earlier, anytime a link comes back to your blog, it makes your, your standings um, stronger in Google and the other search engines. So that's something you want to be doing all the time. Twitter. Um, Twitter is an interesting phenomenon. I, I'll be the first to tell you I don't get Twitter, but I know how to use Twitter. Uh, my daughter, my 18-year-old daughter, is on Twitter all the time, and she uses it a lot like I would use um, instant, instant messaging or, or texting. She is, her friends are communicating all the time. And I think, it's, it, for me, that would be a horrible platform to do such a thing. But what Twitter does is it's a, a stream of, of short messages and they kind of scroll by. I have, I follow, I don't know how many it says on there now, but at one point I followed 2,000. I followed close to 2,000 people, and their messages scroll by on my Twitter feed. And that it comes out to 20, 30 every time I click it. It could be 
hundreds and hundreds of, of, of different li um, tweets in an hour. And there is absolutely no way I can follow those carefully. No way I can read them all or no desire to. It's fun to get on occasionally for five minutes or so and see what's going by. So I really don't actively read much on Twitter. It's not something I use. But I do use Twitter to let people know what I'm doing. And on Facebook and on, um, on my blog, I can set those up. And on Etsy, we'll talk about that in a minute. You can link all those to your Twitter account so that every time you post something, it goes out on your Twitter account. So I have it set up that way. And you can see, if you look at my feed here that Hannah's put up here, you'll just see, actually, I can't see. I'm going to lean in a moment. Yeah, just I, I posted a photo of this. I posted a photo of that. And it just gives people an opportunity to um, to look, at, look in on, on what I'm posting. Um, when I sell something on Etsy, it goes up there. And we're going to talk about that. Well, I'll talk about that now. Um, on Etsy, the Etsy is where I was. it was really proven to me that Twitter is an effective tool. Because if I manually go in and tweet about a, an Etsy listing, I will immediately get 10, 15, 20 hits on my Etsy site of people that went within seconds, saw it streamed by on Twitter, and went to Etsy to see what it was. So there are people watching their streams all the time. Uh, they may all be 18-year-old girls. I don't know. I don't think that's true. Um, I did listen to a really good audio workshop on Twitter once, and it's the way I got started. I want to I want to share that. And that comes from craftcast.com. I talk about that a little bit on my blog. Again, at www.50littlebirds.com. It's listed. The, it's the last link the, on today's posting. Um, and I don't remember the gentleman that was interviewed, but he had a really great strategy for how to make yourself known on Twitter, and it's exactly what I did, and it works. It's a little underhanded, um, but it, it's not dishonest. It's certainly within the rules. And that is to set up your Twitter account. And again, you know, I could talk about this. Everything we're doing today is branding. Your name is going to be important. I use 50 little birds for everything. And you want to set up your Twitter account with a name that people associate with your art and what you're doing. And then you want to go through and and um, follow. You're allowed to follow up to 2,000 with, a, with a, a normal account. There are ways to get more, and I'm not versed well on that at all. I'd have to go look into it. But you can follow 2,000 people. So I went out and just started following blocks of people. I do searches for the arts. I do searches for folk art. I do searches for traditional art. I get these big lumps of um, people um, or Twitter, Twitter accounts within those searches. So I would get museums and cultural centers and heritage centers and um, artists, and I would um, follow them. And then I would go through their lists and look for people that I think might be interested in what I do, and I'd follow them. And I just banked and banked, followed and followed people until I had those 2,000. It took quite a few hours, and a lot of them were just clicks on people that I didn't know anything about or accounts I knew nothing about. But what happens are a lot of those people will tweet you back. And I picked up a lot of followers very, very quickly. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then the people that are following them begin to look and see who they're following, and they'll pick up on you too. Again, you put your Twitter account name on everything you do. It goes on your blog. It goes on your Facebook. It goes on. Um, it can go, I don't do this. I probably should. It goes on business cards and flyers so that people follow you on Twitter. And it, it takes on a life of its own. I do not. I haven't actively recruited a Twitter follower in probably a year and a half, and I pick up two or three a day. And I probably get two or three a day drop too. But the ones that drop you are the ones that um, probably don't want to, aren't interested in what you're doing anyway. Or they may come back. You don't know. So it's a fickle, a fickle game. All right. I am blasting through this at 100 miles an hour. We'll have lots of time for questions, or I can elaborate on things. Um, selling. Etsy is, I sell I sell on Etsy. When I used to um, set up websites and, and using software or with HTML, I always wanted to sell things. And there were some very, very awkward ways that you could set things up or run them through some kind of checkout. But it was always very difficult. Um, and I probably, to be honest, never made a sale on any of those things that I set up. Etsy has really been a boon to um, 
to artists. I, I did sell on eBay for a while. Um, when I started selling birds, when I very first started selling birds three years ago, um, I posted some, so I put some birds on eBay and they sold for my asking price, what I expected. But with every sale, the price dropped. My last bird sold for $8 and I thought, no, we're not going to do eBay anymore. We've got to find another way. So I've picked up Etsy. Etsy is, is a wonderful platform. Everything is in place. You go through a template and you set up your own storefront and you can see mine there on the right with the 50 little birds header and then you list your work and the price and a description and people can click on those just like on any other sales website and they can go through a regular checkout they can use their credit card and the money comes to you through PayPal and uh, it, it's really slick all you have to do is um, read your emails and, and pack things up and send them off now the thing about Etsy that a couple things you need to be very, very aware of. First of all, Etsy it does not drive sales. eBay, people go to eBay looking to buy things, looking for bargains. And when you put something on eBay, if you get lucky, you can get a lot of hits and drive prices up. On Etsy, people do browse, and you can get occasional sales from people browsing. But it really doesn't pay unless you look at it as a storefront that you're responsible for and that you're responsible for sending people to. So I work a lot to send people to my Etsy site in order to make these purchases. I don't just assume they're going to find it. So to do that, you make sure your Etsy um, address and information is on everything. It's on my business cards. It's in my sales. Well, it's not my sales booth. We'll talk about that in a minute. It's um, on my blog. It's on my um, Facebook page. And that drives people to go there and to shop. And they know it's there. I do not have a lot of Etsy traffic. It's consistent. It's a couple sales a month, but it's not it's not the end-all, beat-all to, to sales online. The other thing is you've got to have fantastic photographs. I, um, at the beginning, hired a photographer who did a really great job, a much better job than I can, and I ended up buying a camera and shooting my own pictures because I, I um, got tired of waiting for the turnaround time. I was itching to get things right online. So I purchased a good camera and learned to take fairly good pictures. The tutorials all over Etsy, all over the line on taking pictures of your work. And it's really important if you want an online presence or even a good blog presence that you learn to shoot your, your work well. So um, I guess that's the lowdown on Etsy. Etsy does have all kinds of forums, all kinds of feedback. There's some really great communities that are built on Etsy. It works a lot like any other social network. You can get as involved as you want to with the people that are there and with what they're doing. Uh, not a social networking thing, but on the lower left is really one of the greatest technology boons to artists in the last couple of years, and that is the Square. That's squareup.com, www.squareup.com. And that little square you see there plugged into an iPhone is absolutely free. And within a few minutes of receiving that and plugging it into your iPhone or your Android or your iPad, uh, you can have an account with Square and take credit cards. They don't charge a monthly fee, and uh, they take a relatively small percentage. It's under 3%. I was running my credit cards through um, PayPal for quite a time. I was paying $30 a month. They were escrowing a third of my money for 90 days. And that got very tedious. With a square, no monthly bills, and a small percentage. And the best of everything is the money's in, your, in the bank the next business day, which is just absolutely amazing. Um, you can go to squareup.com and order one, or... Um, I bought one at Best Buy last weekend. I couldn't find mine before a big show. I went to Best Buy and bought one off the shelf, got home, plugged it in, and put in a code that was with it, and the $10 was put right back in my bank account. So it was still absolutely free, even though I bought it at, uh, at Best Buy. So that, that was a good deal. Um, some new tricks and, and, and tools. I love seeing my big bird up there. Thank you, Hannah. Um, Instagram is an, an app that you can put on your iPhone or your Android. And I've just started playing with this in the last week. I've noticed some of my friends are doing it. And Instagram is, um, like many of the iPhone or, or smartphone apps, it takes um, pictures like the one on the top right of my big bird. It takes retro style pictures in many, many different styles, different black and white and color and sepia, um, retro styles. And, but unlike the other apps that do this, this also is a social network. 
I networked with friends and other artists so that when I take pictures of my work or anything I do, it goes into this social network and their work does too. And I can look at that several times a day and scroll through and see the pictures my friends are taking. It's, I think it has the potential to develop into, into a pretty useful, um, pretty useful app for, um, for social networking. It's certainly not one of the big players, but I think it's going to add to it. Pinterest, a lot of my friends are showing a lot of interest in Pinterest, and it has a lot of potential, too, in being a strong social network to help support your work. Um, unfortunately, I don't, Mike, oh, this is a long story, but I don't have access to Pinterest on a computer because of some safety issues with a computer at work. And so I'm not sure how it works on the computer. I'm using it through my phone. And when I use it through my phone, it's very difficult for me to pin the things I want to. But the way Pinterest works is you um, go out on the Internet and you find the things that interest you that you think are pretty or interesting. They're used, they're images, so we're talking about visual-based things. And you pin them up to your virtual bulletin board, and then you can see your friends' virtual bulletin boards, and you take things off of theirs and put them on yours. So it's a way that you and a network of friends can share the things that you find interesting and uh, visually appealing. And I think it has a, a, a really, um, I, I think it, it could be a very strong player too in the social networking thing, as support, in a support role. Pinterest already has a reputation of being kind of a ladies game. There aren't a lot of men doing things. Um, that's all right with me. My customers are almost all women. and I've ne I, I teach elementary school. I've never spent a lot of time around men. Um, and down the lower left, um, QR codes. And these are these um, barcode-like squares that you see popping up on things. I saw them at Lowe's the other day on some plants. And the, the idea here is that the tag or label that you put on at Lowe's, the tag on these plants, didn't contain all the information that they thought it should. And so they put that code on there, which drives with, with your smartphone. You can scan that code, and it takes you to a website somewhere that has more information. Now, ideally, it'll have more information about the product. I would think on a plant it would have you know, with the zones it should be planted in and how it's taken care of and the amount of light it needs and fertilizing and things like that. Um, I use a QR code in a couple of different places with some success. I keep it in my um, booth when I do art shows. I have a framed QR code that hangs up um, with my um, Indiana Artisan sticker. And people see that and they, they're curious. They want to know what in the world is that going to lead to. And so they scan it and it takes them right to my website. I also have a great big one that I laminated and I put on the back of my bicycle. I have a cargo box on my bike, and I, when I'm not teaching school, I try to have a presence in my hometown of Noblesville. And I ride my bike everywhere I go with a 50 Little Bird sign on the back, and, and I have that QR code, and, I, and people scan that. And it drives a little bit of, of um, traffic to my website. I have seen a little bit of a discussion about whether QR codes are effective or even fair if they just drive you to the website because you're not really getting a whole lot of additional information. And I might want to rethink that and find other ways to use that so that they really feel like they're getting a bonus by scanning that code. Okay, there's my contact information, which means I blasted through everything in a mere 35 minutes. Uh, so I think what I would like to do is I, I do have a lot more things I could talk about and a lot more that we could, a lot more ways this could go. So I would really like to have um, you ask some questions and with my bifocals, I haven't even been able to look at the sidebar to see what people are saying. So ask some questions, and I would love to, um, to, to give you some kind of response on that. Let's see what's coming up. We see that somebody's typing. Yeah, Twitter. Twitter the question is, can Twitter been, be done on a computer? And yeah, Twitter is, is, any of these things are easier to do on a computer with a big, well, not all, things that aren't app-based are much easier to do on a computer. So yeah, it's um, twitter.com, and um, you can set it up on a regular computer. And like any of these things, they're in, including doing webinars, they're intimidating at first. And um, it's really important to get in there and practice and watch the traffic and just play with it and get comfortable with it. And don't worry about people out there judging you because I don't think they are. Um, that's not been my experience. So, yeah, you can you can do Twitter without the iPhone. I did an awful lot of this before I ever. I've only had my iPhone about a year, so I did, was doing a lot of this before that.
lot of questions about what's my work schedule on blogging and web development. Yeah, I, um, in addition to being a full-time artist and performer, I'm a full-time teacher. So I've really had to develop ways to do this on the fly. Luckily, I have a passion for writing, and I teach writing. So I look at my, um, a lot of my blog writing is, is practicing my writing. And uh, um, you'll even find some fiction and um, essay if you dig far enough back in there from when I'm at writing workshops. I, that being said, my blogging is sloppy. It's full of mistakes. I, I'm very, very bad about going through and proofreading things. So, um, but anyway, my work schedule in terms of doing the social networking is that I usually find a time during the day to blog. I, um, I have some time during the day I can take, short time, 20, 30 minutes. I don't like to spend more than that blogging most days. I spend my days looking for things to blog about. Um, for instance, today I went out to, to Goose Pond and did a lot of birding. There are a lot of pelicans out there, which people find amazing in Indiana. It is amazing in Indiana. And so that gives me something to blog about. Um, I use a lot of croquet balls in my work. I, use them, I cut them in half and use them as bases. And I've been claiming for quite a while, tongue-in-cheek, that I'm the world's largest recycler of croquet balls. But this morning I stopped at an antique store in Bloomington to buy some croquet balls and met a man that, an antique dealer that restores croquet sets and has sold, bought and sold oh, nearly 6,000 croquet balls in the last few years. So I, those are stories I'm going to blog about. So I go through my day looking for those stories. And usually the first time I have some free time, I'll sit down and, and type those. And I try to blog, post to the blog once every day with an image. I don't get that done, and I don't feel guilty about it. If I have to skip a day or two, that's the way it is. The numbers will drop often when you skip a few days. You'll see a response to not keeping it fresh. By keeping it fresh, people come back on a regular basis. I do carry an iPhone now. And I can blog from my phone. I don't like to. It's a. It's kind of a stilted format because it's tiny. The keyboard's hard to work with. Um, but I do blog from my phone occasionally. Things like um, Facebook posts I do from my phone continuously throughout the day. I stopped at a handmade shop in Bloomington this, this afternoon that sells my work um, and took a picture of the store, took a picture of the shelf of my work, and I'm going to put that up on Facebook as soon as I, as I get a chance. I put, while I was sitting here and there doing the sound checks, I put the picture on Facebook. So those things are ongoing. With the phone, it only takes a moment or two to do that. So I spend a minute here, a minute there throughout the day keeping up with Facebook, both on my professional side, the business side, and the, and the social side. And then I try to spend 20, 30 minutes almost every day sitting at the computer, uh, keeping up with the emails and um, writing blogs and responding to, to the comments on blogs. Also, I, 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 it's really important you respond to people that respond to you. When you write a blog and somebody makes a comment, Find something to say to them. Thank them for their comment. Ask them a question. Um, include them in the conversation. Those comments are really important for your web traffic, but more important, you're building relationships with these people at a personal level. That's the whole idea of social networking is get them interested in you. And for that to happen, you have to be interested in them. So make sure you respond to their blogs and don't ignore their, their reactions to your work. Okay, let me see what else is coming up here. A uh, question for Diane is, um, do I send people directly to Etsy and send on my website? And I don't. I send them to the website first because it's right there at the top. It sends them to Etsy. And it's easy to remember, 50littlebirds.com. I, quite frankly, would stumble on my Etsy address. Um, so I send them always to the blog first because from there they can explore what I do. And they will find my Etsy site because it's right there on the top right. And they will find my Facebook, and they'll find my Twitter feed, and they'll find all the other things. So it gives them a chance to see the whole package. The blog is really the place to put together. It's kind of the launching pad for everything that I do. Oh, that's a great question. You're asking about negative, um, negative feedback on blogs and social media, and it does happen. I um inadvertently shortchanged somebody on a hat I sold them once, and they, oh, they sent some nasty things out that, were, that may or may not have been true, but they weren't positive. And I communicated with him directly and resolved it immediately, and he sent out apologies. Um, and it was my error, and I was the first to admit it. So I guess one thing is uh, negative feedback is, if it's reasonable, be honest and fix it. But I haven't gotten a lot of negative feedback beyond that. There was one time on, uh, um, I was running a ukulele workshop, for a nonprofit, 
for the Bluestone Folk School in Noblesville. And I was pushing really hard. It was a ukulele building workshop, and I was pushing really hard on um, flea market music where I'd been. I was one of the senior people. I'd been there for years and years and years. And somebody was griping that it seemed like I used to be so helpful. Now I was doing it was selling things. And I realized I was too pushy. Again, that was my mistake. So I apologized and backed off there too. Um, I think if it was something up there that I didn't agree with or it was inflammatory or unreasonable, I would probably ignore it. I think that would be very difficult to do, but that's probably the best way to keep things like that from from growing. <laughs> Um, Diane, let's see, make sure I'm on the right line. Diane's asking about invitations um, on Facebook and sending out reminders. I don't think I've ever sent out reminders. I need to look at that and see. One of the things I've got to be honest about is a lot of these things I set up two, three years ago, and I wouldn't even begin to tell you how to set them up today. Um, that's why I don't get into that a whole lot. I'd be happy to walk somebody through that if we ever needed to. Um, but I know that last time I looked at Facebook, invitations there was no reminder if there is one that's great um i would send it to the maybes and yeah i, I and she's asking if you just send those to the maybes i would I, I hesitate a moment because there are an awful lot of people on facebook that confirm they're coming to your event and they don't it seems to be um this phenomenon where people are eager to, eager to please performers eager to please artists and they tell you they're going to be at an event and even if it's a maybe they put yes and then they don't show up so I, I would almost want to send reminders to everybody so that those people that said yes, remember that they have they said that they're going to be there. And Gail's bringing up a good point, too, that um, if you just post, I and this is what I do do this, you put reminders up in your regular, um, your regular feed on uh, the timeline. I'm trying to think of what the word is I use now. Your regular timeline on your... Um, personal and your business Facebook pages that goes out to the to the same people that you've invited and I do do that and I do that indirectly too um, I had a show the show I did in the Indiana Artists and Marketplace last weekend which was a phenomenal show by the way um, not to be missed next year um, I indirectly remind people I send um, photographs and descriptions of me setting up the booth I send out um, notifications that I'm preparing uh, well, I print my own tags. I sent out, I even wrote a whole blog about me printing tags for the show, about signage for the show. In fact, Gail helped me with signage last year, proofreading some things. Um, so leading up to a show, I will walk people through my preparation for that show so that they know how much work it is, which helps value your work, and so that they are getting constant reminders that there's a show coming up. Um, same thing if I'm performing. I'll talk about what I'm doing, rehearsing what songs I've discovered, what new songs I may be performing. So that's, those are excellent ways to remind people without really sending out another invitation. Um, and in terms of valuing your work, I guess I want to back up a little bit. This goes back to Etsy. I don't ever tell anybody about my Etsy site at shows unless they ask me directly because you'll get this response where they're, oh, okay, well, I'll just go online home tonight and I'll get it online, and they don't. They forget or that's their out or whatever, and everybody deserves an out if they don't want to buy something. You know, that's fine, but don't give them that out. Don't say, well, you don't don't tell them about the Etsy site up front in a booth at an art show. That's something they can find if they dig on your website. They will find it. You give them your card, but you don't want to give them a chance to say, oh, okay, I'll buy that on, online t tonight because that just gives them a chance to walk away. John's asking about my brand. Just a moment. I have to lean in with these bifocals to read this. John's asking about why I branded 50 Little Birds instead of Jeff Davis. And there are a couple reasons for that. One is the kind of art shows that I first worked with, which are the DIY shows, the Indie, Handic Indie Handicraft Show in Indianapolis and the Bloomington Handmade Market, play, or Market, which is tomorrow or Saturday, by the way, here. I'm not going to be there, but it's a great show. Um, the artists that are in those shows like to have uh, business names. It's just part of the um, branding that they all use. And... Um, it's kind of part of that, um, that that whole feel of that kind of show. And that's where I got started. Even though I'm not young and hip, that's the kind of show I started with. So 50 Little Birds was for that. I also 
used, a, used my um, carvings to brand the Bluestone Folk School. Bluestone Folk School is a traditional arts program that I founded in, in Noblesville three or four, about four years ago. And we're always in, in need of um, cash. And so when I decided that I was going to be marketing um, folk carvings of birds, I donated the first 50 birds to the folk school so that all the income from the sale of those first 50 birds would go directly to the folk school. I did that for a few reasons. One was to um, let people know I was altruistic and I was supporting a good cause, to let people know about the folk school and give a reason to talk about that as I sell my art, to develop a following, having at least 50 good sales um, behind me before I start off on my own with my art sales. Um, and it really worked well. Those first 50 birds, though some were those ones I sold on eBay for $8, but those first $50 generated several thousand dollars for the folk school. And they um, did start some collectors. Some people started their collections then that are still buying today. So it really did get me out there with my feet under me. Another reason I didn't use my name is because I do, I've do. i done, my, my pattern as an artist, as many artists are or do, is I follow one discipline. I get pretty good at it. And then I find something else catches my eye. I see a new shiny object and I run for that. In the past 20 years, I've been a chalkboard artist, a book artist. I've built boats. I've um, built furniture. Uh, I've been a printmaker. I've done letterpress, topography. All those things, I got to a pretty high skill level and I moved on to something else. And I want to make sure that when people hear about 50 Little Birds, they know exactly what I'm doing. If I was branding myself as Jeff Davis, I'm not sure if they would know whether they're going to hear a ukulele player see a ukulele builder, or um, see a printmaker. I, I, so I uh, wanted to do something that was still me, um, but didn't it wasn't associated with all the other things that, I, that I've done and, and still explore from time to time. All right, any other, any other thoughts or questions? Okay. Um, looks like John came in to wrap up. I want to thank all of you for coming. It's really great to have this turnout. I hope um, that, that what I said was valuable to you. Valuable to you. I want to apologize for rushing through the first half before I found my pace. That's part of the learning to do the webinars, I guess. Um, but I want to, again, thank you very much. Please contact me. It's 50littlebirds at gmail.com or um, visit my blog. Um, to see the notes for this for this discussion at 50littlebirds.com. And I would be, I'd love to um, continue this discussion through comments or emails so that we can get your questions answered. Or you can teach me a thing or two. Thank you so much. Here's John. Thank you very much, Jeff. I really appreciate you being here today. And what a great, uh, great webinar. You did just great work, covered a lot of territory. And I don't think you were too fast. I felt like it was a, a good, good pace. Uh, and, and a lot of good resources. If you look in the sidebar, you can see a lot of websites that uh, Chad has logged for us there. If folks are interested, they can download this probably in a couple of days uh, from the Traditional Arts Indiana website uh, so that they can uh, you can have it and you can share the links with other people. Um, but thanks a lot, Jeff. I really appreciate it. Uh, if you like this workshop, we'd love to uh, we'd love to hear from you. We'd love to have also additional uh, ideas about future um, future webinars that we might be able to host and present to you. Let us know if you're finding these useful. Also, let us know where you would like to see us uh, promote this uh, this type of information a little bit more. We're sending it out a variety of places, but if you know some place we should put it, let us know. Uh, again, this is a webinar that was brought to you by Traditional Arts Indiana and uh, the Indiana Arts Commission as well as uh, Indiana University. And I'm John Kay. Uh, look forward to hearing you.